Um, I can show you guys my white box setup, which is over there. I can show you my, my pile of nonsense that I haven't sorted yet, some of which includes aquatic, like underwater photography and stuff like that, if anyone's getting into that. And I can do tips and tricks for aquatic insect photography if anybody's an aquatic entomologist. Um, there's some cool stuff you can do there. So um, yeah, anyways, um, do, I guess maybe we should ask if anybody has questions about like uh, unfamiliar with, with photography, videography, camera like equipment and specifications. Um, if everybody knows f-stop, ISO, white balance, what that is, what that means, I can go into more detail about that. I say that just to say that um, kind of especially for videography and especially for like for, for time lapses, it's really helpful if for, I don't know what kind of time lapses most people are interested in. I have time lapses of like um, landscapes, clouds moving over, that kind of thing. But then I also have landscapes or um, time lapses that are interesting, useful, important for entomologists and scientists broadly uh, for things like showing showing growth of a plant, showing uh, insect eclosing from its pupa, um, something like that, right? That So there's situations where you could use traditional videography to document behaviors uh, or motion. You can use that video um, through something like um, Image J, or there's there's a number of different uh, kinematic software things. If you're looking to do kinematics or flight or motion, any of that kind of stuff, and that can be like traditional videography. Time lapse, especially what you're trying to do with time lapse, is basically speed up a process and and observe uh, something at a little bit of a faster clip rate. So the way I shoot time lapses. Um, there's a lot of ways you can do them with phones now. Uh, GoPros have like a time lapse setting. All kinds of things have time lapse settings. You, virtually what all those do, do is you take a still image every such interval. So you intervalize it with a built in intervalometer. And you just chunk, 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 maybe every 10 seconds, 20 seconds, what have you and you build hundreds and hundreds of frames that you then play back at 24 frames a second or 30 frames a second to produce a video. So lots of cameras now even will just do that, all that processing software in-house for you, um, or they will, you can use some software to do that. And I can, I can show, demonstrate some of that. But again, all of this is to say that for me, there's there's probably I'm not good enough at Photoshop to to like make something up, but you know you've seen Marvel movies, you've seen commercials like freaking car insurance commercials these days have CGI mascots and and whatever. So you can create anything you want in Photoshop. For me, it's a lot easier if you get it right in camera first, get all the lighting right and all that, and then you have to do only minimal processing things like that then. Um, so I can talk about getting the setup right in camera and then following through with that. So, yeah, and I can uh, share my screen and we can do do some different things like that. Again, throw anything you guys want in the chat if you have any any questions, anything like that. Um, so I'm, uh, I'll, I guess I'll start with photography in terms of some of the f-stop settings, ISO, things like that. Um, and then I can show you guys some some editing for that because then that also plays into the settings you want to have for your time lapses. Um, and one key thing with time lapse video and creating um, a good time lapse video or a video that captures what you're trying to communicate, the main things with time lapse for me are uh, the main thing with all photography is knowing your subject, right? So for an effective uh, time lapse, effective videography, you still have to know your subject and you have to know what it is that you're trying to communicate. So if, for example, you want to take a time lapse of a butterfly eclosing from a pupa, you need to know when that butterfly is about to pupate, when it's about to emerge, about how long that process takes so that you can then do some division and figure out how many frames you need to capture because you might capture one frame an hour 
and the butterfly will close in three minutes, right? And you'll have missed the occlusion. And if it is three minutes, you'll want to take a frame every two seconds, maybe, you know, depends how, how long you want to do it. Or you could just set up a video, but it might be like a three hour video that you have to go in and edit, right? So most videos are shot at 24 or 30 frames a second. Um, my SLR cameras, my, my current ones that I have, all only can take 29 minutes and 59 seconds of video in one chunk. You can then repeat the video. But you know, if you're trying to do a butterfly eclosion and you think it'll emerge in the next hour and you wanna just take a straight video, you, you might not, you might miss it, right? So that's partly why I do time lapse for something like that. In addition, it just kind of looks cool because you get that time lapsey, um, speed it up process, which which is cool. But you need to know how long to expect that and the framing and everything like that in order to make an effective um, video. So I can show a quick time. Let me see if I pulled up. Oh, I had pulled up a uh, time lapse here. Closini Licinia. I think this one was not bad. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can share screen. I still, God, I haven't done a Zoom thing in forever. <laughs> I don't, I don't remember anything about the Zoom. Bottom. Yeah. Um, uh, screen. And then, yeah, like as many examples, I think, at least for me, I, I think it would be useful to like, yeah, see a bunch of examples of your photography and maybe you can just kind of explain the behind the scenes, like what types of settings you used and like maybe co some compositional kind of things or whatever, like that that would be my suggestion. I don't know if other people have other ones. Totally. That's, those are my biggest, always my biggest pieces of advice for um, photography is knowing your subject, knowing your equipment so that you can forget about the equipment you, you want to know every button and what it does so that you just get your settings right so that you can then be focusing on the insects behavior or the interactions. If you want two ants looking at each other, right, and wiggling antennae, that'd be a cool shot that communicates something about ant pheromone communication and ants living in a colony, whatever. That's an example. Um, you need to be paying attention to those two ants and hit, get the timing right, hit the button right when you're right when they look at each other. Um, so you don't want to be thinking about f-stop. You don't want to be thinking about, did I get the ISO setting right? Um, get that all set up or get it so that it's so second nature to you that you just can change it on the fly. And then also, yeah, composition is, is a huge thing. This is you, photography and even videography, all, all, the only difference is it moves in videography, but in both, you get a flat rectangle. You get four by six image rectangle. And it's your job to fill it with what you want and to exclude what you don't want. And that, that is one of the biggest things to go to take better photographs is to make photographs rather than take photographs. You want to move from just snapshotting, fill the center of the frame with everything to what if I move something outside the frame? What if I include this element in the background? What if I exclude this element in the background because it's distracting right you kind of move and play and that is called composition and, and getting your composition and that's a skill um that's something it takes a while but that's an essential step to getting towards better photography um so let me share this movie real quick can everybody see that yeah maybe okay and i'll full screen it maybe okay so this is a time lapse of a of a checkered butterfly from texas if this will play is that playing up yeah. oh, there it goes Bloop. there she comes there's the wings expanding pumping hemolymph into all the veins and you can see that Bloop. that's what's cool in this case about time lapse is a regular video this process took i don't know 15 or 20 minutes at least um and that would kind of be boring to watch and you wouldn't be able to see the transition. But when you see like plants growing super fast or things like that, it, that definitely looks really cool. Um, what you can, what you notice about this, now see partly this is like going on too long or, and you can see where the transition started about here. She pops out very quickly. So in this instance, I didn't, um, 
I didn't capture enough frames. My, my pace between the frames was too long. My duration in my interval between the frames was too long. Had I been able to take more frames, I would have had more data in there. And you could have seen her, it wouldn't be so choppy uh, when she's coming out. But the pumping of the wings turned out really nicely. You, you got a, a, a pretty nice sort of flow um, to the pumping of the wings. So this ended up, I can look, I can try to find the, the actual frames of this, but this was probably something like several hundred, maybe six, 700 frames that were each taken probably 10 seconds apart. Um, so that's the thing with time lapses is, is doing the mental math of like, okay, I think my process takes about 15 minutes. How long, if I want to communicate 15 minutes in like 30 seconds, maybe, um, then you got to think about, okay, what's the frame rate I want to play it at? I usually prefer 24 frames a second, um, but something 24 or 30 frames a second. So if you have 30 frames a second for 30 seconds, you need 900, let's call it, you know, a thousand frames. So if a thousand, and if your event takes 15 minutes and you want to capture it in a thousand frames, that's whatever that is, you know, hundred frames a minute, or let's call it, let's call it 10, 10 minutes, thousand frames, hundred frames a minute. So you need to take a frame every, uh, like quicker than, quicker than one second, right? It'd be 60 frames a second would only get you so much. Um, or if it's clouds moving over and it's like hours and hours of cloud progression, um, you could then, I mean, that could be hours and hours. You want to condense it to 15 seconds. You might only take an image every minute, every two minutes, something like that. But knowing, having an idea helps you uh, properly prep, uh, adequately prep for what the time lapse would be. Um, so let me stop sharing that. Um, okay. Are most folks here entomologists or most folks all over the spectrum, sort of art, broadly science? Yeah, so we're different science grad students in different departments. So we've got some plants, some plant people. We got like three of us are entomologists here. Uh, statistics, um, uh, paleontology, and then there's, and, and then Excellent. there's, the ones that are going to be viewing this online later so excellent yeah I, I can't help the paleo folks much or the statisticians much we can make a slow time lapse of a of a bar of a line graph or something <laughs> but uh no totally um uh, yeah any aspect of science communication you can use visual communication is so important because humans are visual animals, right? And we really respond and communicate visually uh, with our world. Um, so demonstrating something in a, in a visual capacity, showing growth, showing some interesting behavior with, with video or stills, jumps right at the heartstrings and really communicates a lot with saying a little. So yeah, especially the botanist, the, the plant bloom type of time lapses, those are, those are great. But again, it does take knowing how about how long does it take for a peony to open right you got to kind of think about that frame up your shot and then let the intervals run and run and run um, for that one critical thing for macro especially here's where i'll get a little technical macro um and for anyone that doesn't follow let me know macro what you're what you're usually doing is you're doing dealing with small things so you need to like a microscope use a lot of lens power, uh, like a macro lens, this is a dedicated macro lens that um, will magnify your subject. And you could focus on something about here, magnifies the subject, makes it bigger in the frame. Um, doing that though, you lose a lot of light with macro. It's just like with a microscope, you might only get this tiny sliver of, of a focus band that you want to keep the things in focus. So to, get as much depth of focus as you want, as you can, you're usually with macro shooting at F16, F18, something like that. Even with macro video, you want to shoot at a pretty high F-stop. Now, what that means is that you're gonna be losing light and you have to replace that light somehow. So even in a studio setting, I'm, if I, even I'm shooting like F8 to take video, I still will use a, you know, a LED light, different illumination, 
and I'll crank the ISO up because I'm just trying to get as much light as I can. Um, although high ISO impacts the image quality, things like that. But all that is to say, you also want kind of consistent lighting throughout the duration of your time lapse, for example. So time lapses is one area where I actually don't recommend flash because flash, if you can get consistent exposure with flash, that's great. But if you're going to take like a photo every 10 seconds for two hours, you're probably going to run the battery down on your flash. You might run out of flash power or it'll attenuate. And then your image, um, your, your resultant video will look like it has these weird dark and bright and dark and bright periods in it, right? The, the exposure might be all over the place. Um, so for those, if you need additional lighting, I would recommend some kind of continuous light source. So like video lights, um, photo, those could just literally be incandescent bulbs, LEDs, what have you. Um, it could literally be a lamp pointed at your subject. This is a LED panel that has a hot shoe mount that can go right onto my camera. So if I'm taking um, macro video, what I'll often do is shoot with something like this and usually shoot with a tripod um, or at least brace it on there. And then I've got this angled to where it's going to light up my subject. And this thing can be pretty, pretty bright, pretty darn bright. Um, and even here, I'm still need maybe like F8 uh, and a pretty high ISO, but then I can take sort of video of, um, oops, video of critters. Uh, and sometimes I'll do that in my white box to help bounce that around. I actually, let me see if I can quickly find some video of some Columbula that I just took um, that I haven't, I haven't even seen if that, uh, if that came out well or not, but <laughs> we can, uh, we can play around with that anyways. Um, so does anybody have any questions about anything so far? Uh, anyone have a have anything in the chat that they want to? So, but um, put up? it would okay. be useful to like just really quickly like describe like the those you know three main settings right like aperture ISO and shutter speed. And yeah, totally. Um, yeah. So um, a, a camera is basically made up of. Let me um, go into. Well, actually, raise your hands if you think that'd be useful. If you guys know that already, uh, leave yeah. your hands down, I guess. <laughs> okay. Let me see if I can. Oh, did, are people's hands? Okay, somebody's hand went up. Uh, okay. Oh, why am I not showing all the way? There we go. Let me share this. Can everybody see this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ah, okay, good. Um, yeah. This is a talk I gave to some other entomological society in Florida. Um, we're, we're way cooler than them. <laughs> but this, can y'all, oops, there we go, see this? Yeah. This is something called the exposure triangle. Um, so what you're trying to do with photography, photography is taking light in, putting it on a sensor, making an image. You used to do that with silver plates, <laughs> colloid film, uh, f you know, actual film exposure. Uh, you could do it with a pinhole camera, you could do it daguerreotype, all that, right? Now we have digital sensors that basically record the amount of the amount and the color of the sort of photons that are that are coming in at whatever you're pointing at, and they register it as an electronic signal and create convert that into pixels. Um, but you need light coming in. You can't photograph in you know a pitch black room. You wouldn't photograph. You'd you'd get a black photo, right? Um, and the ways that you can manipulate that light is with shutter, aperture, and ISO. And there's other things to play with, but those are the main things that affect the overall exposure. ISO is super easy. That's the lower the number, the less sensitive the sensor is to light. So basically the darker the picture, everything else being equal. The higher the ISO number, the more sensitive it is and the brighter the image gets. It's not a panacea because once you get to the high numbers of ISO, you get a lot of grain, you get a lot of noise in the image and it degrades the quality of the image. Um, but that's that's one main way uh, to just overall light or dark on your image. 
aperture and shutter speed can also be used to affect that, but they also kind of have effects on the, the resultant image. Aperture is the literal hole, the opening that you let the light in. The, the bigger the hole, the more light that comes in. So if I have my macro lens, you might be able to see this, um, the actual, uh, there it is, the actual aperture, there you go. The actual aperture on this lens opens and closes, right? So there I'm letting a lot of light in, there I'm letting almost no light in. But, um, so, so the, the wider open your aperture is, which weirdly means uh, the lower f-stop you have, it's kind of this inverse thing, but shooting at like f1.8, f2.8, f2, those are really wide open apertures, that lets a lot of light in. Shooting at f16, f18, what have you, that really narrows the window, doesn't let a lot of light in. But just like with your eyes, if anybody has like wears glasses or has eye problems, uh, I do, I wear contacts. When I'm wearing my glasses, if I if I don't have them on and my my vision is my natural vision, which is bad. <laughs> I can actually improve my vision if I squint. Anybody like notice that? You, you can make things sharper if you squint. And what you're doing is using a property of light called diffraction. You're diffracting the light um, so that you're actually getting more photons to fall onto your sensor um, and you get a sharper image. You can do the same thing with a camera. You reduce the aperture down and it sharpens the image. Um, Conversely, you might want to have a wide open aperture that has the smooth, creamy, nothing behind it background, right? So aperture affects the exposure, but it also affects the composition in terms of what's in focus front to back, if that makes sense. Shutter speed, the faster the camera takes a picture, that doesn't let a lot in, in a lot of light. You can hold the shutter open and then close it, and that'll take in more light, right? Now that can affect the exposure. What that also affects is how blurry the photo is. Because if you've ever taken a photo in like a dark room, the camera goes chuk, chuk. And if you're not holding it perfectly straight, you'll, you'll get a blurry photo, right? Um, you can use that to your advantage if you want photo blur, but it, it affects the image. So all of those together make up the actual exposure of the image, whether you have a dark, image, a sort of well-exposed image, or a too bright image. You get blowouts in one spot or the other. We can talk about HDR, high dynamic range, if anybody wants to do that. Um, you can change exposure settings. But if we're specifically talking about ISO, would be just like brightening up the image, no other, nothing else considered, and getting to a brighter image. You use this often with like star photography, stuff like that, high ISO, to record a lot of light on the sensor. Um, if you change your shutter speed, you can adjust the amount of light that comes in, but you will have, for example, a, a fast shutter speed will freeze motion, a slow shutter speed will blur motion. Now you might want that or not, and that's something we can talk about with composition. Um, here, here's an artistic image, right, of a blurry background with insects. Um, and then aperture, don't worry about all of this stuff, but just aperture. Um, is is how big the lens is. And a small aperture, your viewer focuses on the thing that's in focus, which is this this cherry blossom right there, or plum blossom, whatever this one is. Uh, but if you use a higher aperture, everything's sharper, but everything in the background comes into focus as well. So then that necessitates that maybe you move your position, try to find something that's not as close in the background, or you can use a shallower aperture to blow out the background. And you can do macro photography at shallow apertures, but it's ideal if you frame the subject sideways or something like that, try to get the most um, the, the most in focus as, as you can. Um, we could talk about depth of field. So yeah, here, here for example, is kind of a shallow aperture image of a mayfly and it, but it kind of forces your eye to lock on to the turbulent eyes on this male, which are, which are cool. Um, and indicative that it's a male and it's looking for mates and talk, speaks to the behavior of mayflies, um, which we can talk about if anybody doesn't know about them. Um, or you could have something where you're trying to maximize depth of field, right? This is actually a focus stacked image and I can talk about focus stacking as well. 
um, to, to, and the point of this image is just to, that everything's kind of sharp and it draws your eye that it's, whoa, that's, that's really sharply focused. Um, so to do things like this, which is a focus stack, uh, or this guy, which is a focus stack, these are the images that you can use and you can just chunk, 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 see how I'm taking like slices of the image going from front to back. They're only the back tarsi are in focus here, you know, the, the head and the antennae are in focus, then further back, further back is in focus. And then you blend them all together to make a focus stacked image where everything is sharp front to back. So I can talk more about how to do that, but we can also go on to, to time lapses, stuff like that. Um, let me let me leave the rest of this for now, and and we can do some other sort of example uh, things, um, and we can talk about time lapses as well, and try to do like a time lapse video or something like that. Um, but yeah, I can also just throw up like examples of photos. One thing I thought would be cool to do if you guys want to do white background images, which are really nice for generating like PNGs. They're good for presentations. They're good for scientific publications. Um, and they just make a nice clean looking background. If anybody's seen the meet your neighbors, whatever consortium, um, it's a thing called meet your neighbors, which does a ton of, uh, it, it's a style of photography, uh, and they have a, a group of, um, photographers all around the world. Um, Oh, but I don't know where their actual website is, but oh, they used to have an actual, maybe they don't have an actual website anymore. Anyways, the whole point of it is photographing critters on a white background and plants and fungi and whatever on a white background. So all you see is like the image of the critter. Um, and it kind of makes things stand out and be like, whoa, that's a cool thing. I've never seen that in my backyard, but that's what a ladybug looks like when you take it off of the plant and you go, whoa, you can see the detail. Um, so I do a lot of that kind of shooting again, mostly for, so I have a bank of stuff for publications or for PNGs and stuff like that. And literally today, uh, it might've been delivered when I was up on the mountain, but um, literally today, I just got Sarah Rose's awesome new book. Everybody should own this fucking amazing. Um, Spiders of North America. Sarah's an awesome biologist. Um, she solicited pictures a year or two ago. There was a call out from, this is Princeton Press. Um, so uh, she was looking for a photo of a particular jumping spider species that I had happened to have photographed in Texas. So that's my photo right there, that, that female. And you can see how it's all a white background so that it's all, oops, did I? I put the spotlight, so. Oh, gotcha, gotcha. <laughs> it's like, I don't understand. So yeah, so you can see how this is kind of an all white background. And then you can put like a word in there. You can overlay the text with it um, so that you're not, uh, there's, there's kind of nothing overlapping versus like a square photo. It, it'd be hard to, to crop this down and delete all that stuff to, to where that's just a, um, just a photo uh, or just, just like a PNG of, of the image. Um, so yeah, I made 50 bucks raking in that dough and got a free copy of the book. Um, but what's cool is just hopefully somebody that is trying to identify that spider can have an easier time of it with, um, you know, with the help of this book or whatever. Um, but to take a clean image like that, I can show you guys exactly how to do that and how I would process that image as well. So editing, again, my digital asset management is something everybody should be good at, and I suck at it. I'm really bad. <laughs> and editing is a whole skill uh, and has lots of different ways to do it that, that you can be good at, and I'm not very good at it. But I'll show you guys what I do, what works for me, the software that I have. The, there's lots of different software at lots of different costs that can do lots of different things. Usually the more expensive software can do more things than the cheaper software, but something like GIMP would work for 99% of what most people need to do in Photoshop, or at least um, manipulating exposure and, and et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's certain things, the, the more graphic designy type of stuff in Photoshop, there's certain tools that are kind of unique to Photoshop and you have to pay money for. Um, I think university gives decent licensing um, on some of that stuff. 
Uh, and then time lapse, same thing. There's tons of ways to do time lapse and then tons of ways to do video and edit video. Uh, I have just started using DaVinci Resolve is a really good um, resource I would recommend for videography, video editing. We had a video you, um, series, uh, two weeks ago, we had a videographer. So we're good with video stuff. Awesome, yeah. awesome. So uh, I, I like DaVinci Resolve. Uh, you can use, they probably might've talked about Adobe After Effects and, and all these different things. There's lots of ways to put text or zooms or what, you know, whatever. Um, but we, <laughs> we go there, but you can use DaVinci Resolve to do time lapses. You can use any of the Adobe products to do time lapses. You can even use Photoshop to do time lapses. Uh, the thing actually that I use, all you really need is something that compiles your photos into a video of a certain frame rate. So I actually usually generate my time-lapse videos in something called Picasa, which was a Google program that they abandoned years ago, but you can still find a zip file for Picasa like three or something I have. It's like this combined photo viewer editor thing. But basically all you're doing is taking your photos and making them into a video, making this like string of 500 photos into a 20 second video. Um, so any program you can use to do that, there's like, you know, any kind of home movies thing. I think even like the, the Windows PCs and Mac PCs, they're, they're photo viewer and editor um, that's, that's downloaded on the computer already uh, can do these, can just stack time lapses together. You can do it through Adobe Photoshop by going through Bridge and importing photos as an image sequence. I can show you guys that. Um, but again, Adobe products cost a lot of money. <laughs> so all you really need for a time lapse is just anything that gets you, that smashes those video, those photos together into a video. And then you can use that video clip in, it, there's other editing you can do in just when you're creating that video clip. But usually what I do is create the video clip, then edit that, color grade it, do zooms, pans, whatever, in some other kind of video editing software. Usually DaVinci Resolve, I'll sometimes flip back and forth to, to Photoshop. Um, so again, and I can show folks that. Uh, my big thing is is just advising setting it up properly so that you have the least crap to deal with and have to monitor uh, you know exposures and all that in in post. So I try to do very little in post. Um, but yeah, so so we can talk about that and we can do a white background photo and I can show you guys how, to, how I do that. Again, there's lots of ways to do that. Photo editing, I would highly recommend Lightroom is probably the, the best photo cataloging service and photo editing service. I have Lightroom and I still have like not fully committed to using it. So I do this weird, don't do what I do. I do this weird managing stuff on a hard drive and just editing what I comes into my brain and then spitting it out on social media or whatever. I really want to get more into keywording my photos um, and getting them up on my website, but um, that you can do best through Lightroom or even through like Flickr or like the online service where you can online keyword stuff. Um, but, but Lightroom will allow you to keep your own database on your own hard drive of um, geo tagged name, keyword tagged, uh, date tagged images makes searching a lot easier. Um, but I'm really bad at that. <laughs> but do as I say, not what as I do, and get Lightroom and, and work some of that. And then I usually use Photoshop. Actually, most of the editing I do is in Adobe Camera Raw, which is a plugin with Photoshop that you can turn on or off. And I usually do some little pre edits in Adobe Camera Raw and then go to Photoshop for the heavy lifting. Um, but you can do all this stuff I'm talking about in Lightroom actually better in some ways. Uh, you can do almost all of this in free programs that are already on your computer and, uh, and, and or something like GIMP, which is, which is free as well. Um, especially for the stuff that's just doing like a white image and try to correct the exposure and all that kind of stuff. If you have to actually content aware, do those like magic erase things where you select something and click delete and then it just turns into the background that's awesome. And the algorithms for that, you got to pay for with Adobe. Um, or some of the phones and stuff are doing that now, like Google Google Pixel um, photos are doing some of that now. But 
yeah, so that there's a whole slew of things, but I can show you the process that I use. And the biggest thing I would say for then all of this, if there's nothing else you take away from today, the only thing is just remember how to Google and go on YouTube accurately and like search, be able to search for tutorials, tons of tutorials for, and just search for like white background tutorial Photoshop or time-lapse Zoom DaVinci. And you'll find like these little keywords and, and uh keyframes yeah re yeah remove backgrounds you can you can do that on an online like portal now as hannah says um it, it's like it's ridiculous how it's available now um i i still i because i have photoshop i use photoshop and you can be very selective about i don't know about this website or canva yeah exactly um yeah there's lots of stuff where you can in photoshop you can really um select with a brush or something like that put a layer mask do blend and remove different things there's you can get a lot more granular um but yeah yeah can canva is awesome uh tons of good design graphic design stuff on there but to get like a png i can show you guys real quick how i would get a png of a white background png of this wolf spider um which i had a male wolf spider i collected from the james reserve a couple of weeks ago um and the way I would do that is I would try to get a clean white background. The best way for me to do that is to use flash and fire that into this big box. That's just a white box. And it's going to reflect the light everywhere, bounce it all over. Everything glows white and you get a good exposure on your critter. So the way that I do that is with a white box setup. So there's my white box setup. It's got a white um, base uh, down there that I put the insect or the whatever on. I've got a cup with flu on right there um, that I can trap the critter in. And I've got a flash here and a flash on that side, two flashes that bounce into this box and just kind of light everything up. Um, so if I can, let me see if I can put the video in a way where you can see what the heck I'm doing. Okay, can everybody see that and see me? And then I've got my camera. This is a radio transmitter that tells my flashes uh, to fire when I press the button. So I'm turning on my flashes. I also put a little LED light panel in here so that I can have light to see my subject when I'm photographing it. I'm gonna, oops, let me give you guys a look. I'm gonna take my spider and dump him underneath this cup and, and trap him down underneath this cup so he doesn't go anywhere. If he'll even come out, he's built a ton of web in here. Good Lord. So this is some kind of probably lycosid or agalenid. Oh, did he go away? He might've, this might've <laughs> not, not be going to plan as much as I thought it would be. Come here, come here, little dude. Oh, did I get you? God, he's quick. Come on, come on. There you go. All right, so you can see what <laughs> you can see what happens. But I get him, oops, smooch him onto my white background. This is just a piece of like white, flexi, uh, plastic type of stuff. And I can do a test fire of my flashes. There we go. So what I'm doing, I already have this recipe drilled in. Um, and what I'm doing for that is I already have the recipe, but you guys can make a background box like this on your own and just play with the f-stop, the ISO, you know, whatever to, to get pretty an almost white background, but I try not to blow out the highlights when I'm when I'm doing something like this because I can push them to be blown out in post, but then I'm not missing anything on uh on the actual subject right um so for me i'm shooting at f18 iso 200 um the highest shutter speed that my camera can communicate with flashes with which is um one two fiftieth of a second most people it's one two hundredth one one twenty fifth anything like that and i'm gonna line up my focus if he'll uh, uh, uh. you gotta kind of do the dance, know your subject, play around with it. Oh, shoot. 
almost got him. He had a piece of a uh, piece of floof on his leg. That stopped me from getting a great shot of him. Let's try that again. Golly. All right, I suck at doing this today. I was hoping this would go a little quicker. Whatever, there we go. All right, good good enough. I got a shot that was semi, semi in focus. So what I can do now is literally, um, I can show you guys the whole process. I've taken the image, it's on my XQD card. Uh, you have to get a special reader for these freaking cards. So, uh, oh, shoot. Uh, I'm going to go silent for a hot minute. I got to pull my microphone up, replace it with the USB, and then, oops. Also, Ian, um, it looks like I asked in the chat, like, what people prefer, and I think people are interested in more like composition stuff and like kind of like what what makes like a photo art if you can like sort of talk about that that would probably be useful hold on okay uh. Okay, that's out of there, that's back in. Okay, can you guys? Can Test. We can you. Oh yeah, no, we, no, we can't. Okay, that's better, all right, perfect. Um, yeah, okay, uh, yes, and I'll do, um, I'll, talk, I'll talk about some composition. I can basically show some different um, images uh, that work well. Let me just quickly, uh share a share a photoshop with you guys i can try to do a see if zoom would actually like let me share that can you guys see that at all yeah cool so let me just see if i have on my desktop uh, ah how do I move this thing around? That one. There's an image. And you can see it's a little bit sort of grayed out. This is opened up in Adobe Camera Raw. Can you guys see that? Did that pop up? Yeah, we can see the spider, yeah. OK, cool. So what Adobe Camera Raw has is a bunch of little sliders. But again, these are similar with lots of different things. So I'll just do like a very quick, especially because it's being recorded, I'll just do a real quick thing of how I would do this. And you guys can use that to also do this with Camera Raw into Photoshop or with other services. You'll It'll be kind of similar process and sliders. And then we can spend the last 10 minutes just talking composition and stuff. Um, so what I do, I've intentionally, my recipe is intentionally slightly underexposed. So I bring the exposure up a little bit without losing too much detail and highlights in here. I bring the highlights up a little bit. I bring the shadows up a little, down a little, depending. Sometimes here, maybe I'll bring it down a little because I want to retain some darkness in the stripes and the whatever on this guy. Uh, I'll add a little clarity, vibrant, saturation. I don't tend to go overboard with any of these things. And I'll bump the whites up, let's say, and try to kind of purely get that. OK, then I'm going to open the image into Photoshop. So again, I'm going like pretty quick with this, but um, just you can watch the recording uh, as we go. Then what I'll do is I'll do like a lasso selection and invert it with control shift invert, hit delete, and I'll delete everything else with white background. And then I'll control D to deselect. And what you can see is I've got it almost there, but there's still a little bit of where the exposure is not fully white. Um, so then what I will do is do something like a, all these zoom controls are all over my thing. Uh, ah. Do something like a levels adjust, darken it just a, a tiny bit, and then pull the levels up. There you go. Uh, and flatten the image. 
and then there it's pretty it's pretty much good to go if there's a spec i will do like a spot remover that's with the hotkey j the spot remover tool or i'll go into like a brush um that is maybe like a mid opacity mid flow uh brush with a, a hazy brush that's set to white and then i can paint in white and clean up or remove some of the shadows you know anything like that and that's basically what i do i'll also do a sh uh, unsharp mask uh and then just you know crop the image down to whatever and then it's ready to go into a spider book and that's that's pretty much the whole process so i can go through um i can go through a lot of more of that uh later uh for anyone that wants to um but but we'll go from there um so instead i can talk a little bit about composition let me um share this with you guys again because i have a couple examples of of what are good compositions in here i would normally advise just my main thing is kind of not getting your your subject in just the dead center of the photo those are great for those PNG type of white background photos, um, but it's so much more dynamic if you move the critter around. Uh, a lot of, okay, is everybody seeing this? And I can go yes. full screen on this. So it, it, a human eye goes first to brightness, then to sharpness, then throughout the rest of the image. So the brightest and sharpest things are gonna be what the eye jumps to. And you can use that to create a composition. You, another thing that helps create a nice composition is a little bit of tension in the image. And often you can do that by putting your subject in this rule of thirds. You don't always have to use the rule. It's good to break the rules, but this is a good space to kind of put things in those four red dots somewhere, somewhere in the top third of the image bottom a landscape looks really good if you're trying to get the clouds and stuff if you put the horizon very low in the image and then it's all sky if you put it so it's straight straight bisecting the image those tend to look kind of boring landscape photos right um you want to use leading lines anything that's in the image it's a straight line that can draw your eye to the thing that you want to communicate about your image uh, or curvy lines human eyes like to follow paths like that that can be an insect's leg that can be a stick that can be a you know anything like that and one of the biggest ways to think about this is just be really intentional about your photos try to do border patrol try to make sure nothing's sticking in a twig or anything from your your border and a really good exercise to get better at doing this is to pretend you're turn your camera into a film camera so take your SLR or whatever camera you have, put some tape like black gaffer's tape over the back of it or turn off the, L, you know, flip the LCD around or whatever, and don't look at the images and only give yourself 24 shots. Pretend you have one roll of film and go out for an hour walk and say, I only have one roll of film. You'll see a cool insect and you'll want to go ah, and take a picture, but you'll go, oh crap, I only have 24 photos. So you'll see the insect, get it right in the middle, get it in focus. You'll want to snap the picture, but then you're going, no, what if I get it a little off to the side? Am I paying attention to the background? How am I, you know, uh, what, what's actually going into the image? What's actually creating the image? That's the, that's the biggest thing. So yeah, border patrol is also important. This is an example, one of Peter Nisgrecki's fucking awesome photographer, photos of a, of a Katie did, I guess, um, with all its legs and wings, they're all right, you know, angular lines that are leading right into that bright red mouth right in the center of the image you can't nobody even notices or cares what, what trees are in the background or the a twig or anything right you're just like whoa right at the insect's face and everything's drawing you there and if your eye moves away it draws back to there um here's something low and in the slight left of the image and then the rest of the the photos of this lubber grasshopper for example um well other than that i'm not gonna go through i won't talk about lighting and so that's a whole thing we can get into um let me very quickly run through this example this is an example of how i made this photograph from 
this photograph. So if ev everybody's probably taking this photo and they want this photo, right? So this photo I took with a um, SLR camera, actually with a telephoto lens. This isn't really macro. This was with this big ass lens, <laughs> but it focused as close as I could get. Uh, but I needed, it was kind of dark. So I needed to add flash. So I did, and it brightened it up. It went from dark to a brighter image. You could see more detail. Then I needed to get closer. So I added these extension tubes that I always have in my pocket. And that allowed me to focus closer still with the flash. Then I used composition to get a lower angle. So I went from this with a less pleasing background. There's some green in there. So I moved to the right and down, framed it up and got a green background, which I think shows off better the wing venation, the you know, coloration, all that kind of stuff. So that's one way of making an image. And then what I can do is I can also share uh, this which is just a um, like compendium of photos of mine. So I'll just leave this on in the background and I will go check the chat. And then if anybody has questions, I've got like a couple of minutes, I can do some questions. We can do something again Thursday if anybody wants to. Um, so, oh, sorry for the spider. <laughs> I've done like all photos of spiders. Um, okay, so yeah, anyone have any questions? Feel free to unmute yourself or type something in the chat. And again, I, missed... I can do a hands-on thing later too. So go ahead. Sorry, um, I missed the very beginning of the talk. I was uh, coming from another meeting. Um, what is your camera setup? Like what, what camera do you use and what lenses for like macro photography specifically? I'm hoping to capture um, ants on cacti. Cool. That's For awesome. Yeah. That's exactly the question you should ask is not what do you have so I can buy it? It's what do I want to photograph? So how, what equipment do I need to use to get right. the photographs that I want? That's totally the way people should be thinking about equipment. Um, mm -hmm. You didn't miss anything because I didn't actually cover that, but I will now. Okay, uh, okay. <laughs> I, I currently shoot Nikon. Uh, okay. I shoot Nikon D500 bodies, which is a crop format factor body uh, with Nikon's 105 millimeter macro lens. I'll also put an adapter on this sometimes um, to get a little closer. Uh, Venus, aka Laowa, is another company that makes some really good, uh, some different products, some really good lenses. I highly recommend their 100, uh, which I don't, I don't know where I put it. Um, but anyways, where did I put that lens? That's a good question. Uh, anyways, they make a, oh, it's attached to my, that's, that's where it is. It's on my, um, this other camera body that I have. Okay. And this is my flight, insects and flight setup. That's a Laowa or Venus brand lens. Um, I'll put that in the, in the chat. Laowa 100 millimeter lens, macro lens. Okay. And it goes from 1X to 2X. So it's, mm -hmm. that's a really good versatile lens. Um, that is a great barrier to entry for macro work. You can use any camera. You can use Canon, Nikon, whatever. I tend to shoot SLR. You can probably find mm -hmm. an older camera body like that. That's totally what I would do is get like a used camera body. Yeah, because... I currently have a Nikon uh, D3400. Perfect. That's yeah. per absolutely perfect. Get mm -hmm. your hands on maybe a used Nikon 105 macro mm -hmm. or one of the um, Tamron makes a really good 90 millimeter macro. Uh, depends if you want autofocus or not. You don't necessarily need autofocus. And then I would use a flash, some kind of flash, either a small body flash or a, a big actual flash. And then you want to do diffusion. You want to soften the light. And we didn't talk about that at all. But what I do is I shoot. Um, I shoot my flash through some kind of white perspex uh, diffusion material, or I'll uh, build a thing to put the flash head in oh, goes okay. here, and that sits on top of the camera like that, and then shoots your subject and diffuses that light. You want a big, 
right surface area to diffuse all your light. You want to build your own cloudy day mm -hmm. uh, is the main thing. And again, I can talk lots more in detail and in person about that. But For I would sure, get just... yeah, I'm going to be there on Thursday to, to be in your ear. About Perfect. This. <laughs> Let's do that. Let's do like a more equipment -y thing on Thursday. And I can show you guys a lot of that. Oh, cool. yeah, that would well. be that'd be really awesome. Because I, I of... inherited all this uh, used equipment and I <laughs> got all these lenses. I'm like, I'm not sure which one to use, like where to start. So that's perfect. The main thing is just play with it. Get messy. <laughs> try it out. You okay. can use. Um, extension tubes to convert almost any lens into a macro lens for way mm -hmm. cheaper than buying a dedicated macro lens. And you can use reverse rings to also do the same. So I can talk a lot more about those. We'll, we'll touch base on a lot of those um, and go from there. So Perfect. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. Thank you guys. I do probably have to run pretty soon too. I can maybe do one or two more quick questions. Oh, uh -huh. is still... uh -huh. I have a quick question. Um, so I'm just counting down the days until Adobe CS4 is no longer compatible with Windows. And I was wondering if you had any good software recommendations for bridge um, processes such as batch rename or batch edit. Yeah, um, Lightroom is probably going to be your best bet. Photoshop can do batch editing. Um, if you're trying to do like batch conversions, there's an Adobe product that I can't remember, but I'll look up and it's called like Adobe ABC or Adobe, some string of letters that can batch convert like um, digital negatives uh, or like camera raw files to JPEGs so that you can upload them to server space. For example, we did this in museum curation where we're taking hundreds of specimen images and they're all in raw format, and then we auto convert them to JPEG to upload and store, um, and to upload onto Specify or Arctos or whatever. Um, yeah, so <laughs> not a lot of uh, not a lot of good options. It's hard when you find a piece of software that's then going to fall apart. But I would recommend Lightroom um, can do batches. GIMP I think can also is free and can also do batch editing. Um, so and there you can create. The other thing you can do with like Photoshop is create a, is you can record a um, macro. So you can record saying, okay, do do a this adjustment, do this brush, do sharpening, and then rename and save as a JPEG. And you record that whole sequence. And then you can apply that to hundreds of thousands, whatever, of photos. That's why I do when I edit wedding photos and they're all just need to be like renamed or something. You just go into Photoshop, open them all up or through bridge. Adobe Bridge is another is basically does this um, and you just batch edit all of those from there. So. Okay, awesome. Thank you. And yeah. thank you for the presentation. You're very welcome. Jess has my contact info and stuff. Jess, feel feel free to send everybody my email and stuff, and we can ping back and forth about more specifics about software and, and stuff like that. So cool. All righty. I think I'm gonna have to go, but let's maybe plan for something Thursday. I think I'll still be here unless I have to go up to the mountain and rescue anybody. Um, but let me know. We'll go from there. Awesome, awesome. Yay. All righty. Oh, did you